Okay, so I'm gonna yeah. let Ashton introduce our, our, our next guest, to, you know, to join us. Um, yeah, so this is another one of my close friends, uh, Nathaniel Mitchell. He's uh, from here in Toronto. He's been in the basketball community for a long time. He's, he started out as a trainer, uh, he's training guys, high school kids, pros, and now he's moved his way up. He's, uh, he's at Fresno State as an assistant, Canadian national team as an assistant. Now he's assistant coach in the NBA for the Charlotte Hornets. So this is one of my good friends, Nathaniel Mitchell. Nat, thanks for joining us. All right. Nat, what's good? What's up, man? How, how you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us, man. You got um, you. You want to take a minute or two and just give us a little bit of your journey? I know you could probably go on for a long time. But, you know, incredible journey you've had, but people may not know. So, um, I mean, was born here, in Toronto, Canada, um, of Jamaican descent. My mother and father was Jamaican, um, and so I grew up in that type of household in the West Indian culture. And pretty much grew up here in Toronto, and, and luckily with our diverse city, um, similar to like in New York or Miami, we have so many other Jamaicans um, that that made it easy to see other people like me to um, you know learn my culture through other people, um, and for me to pick up a basketball again uh, around the city was easy, um, which kind of led me to playing in high school, playing in college. Um, I had dreams, aspirations of being a professional basketball player, didn't work out and, and got into the training um, and where it eventually landed me as a coach uh, to this day. And coaching has been great for me. Um, it's brought me all around the world, um, coaching for our Canadian national team um, and also coaching in the NBA uh, has given me opportunities um, even up until last summer where I got to go back to Jamaica and really uh, help out with basketball with um, Digicel. Um, we did the camp there with the NBA and Digicel combined and they gave me an opportunity to go back. And that for me was big time. I haven't been able to do that. Um, I always wanted to do that and I plan to do that more. Um, just knowing where I came from and my roots and to be able to give back to the youth back there and try to build up um, and I think it's great in the position I am that hopefully I can encourage and help coaches to help the youth get better. Yeah, you know, and that's a, that's a big thing Dave and I talked about too, is like, you know, when you talk about infrastructure, people really think, you know, you know obviously courts and baskets and rims, and, but a big part of infrastructure is, you know, coaching knowledge and curriculum and, and having, having people like you, you know, having these guys have access to people like yourself. and. I think it'd be interesting to hear from Dave, like Dave, like what's, you know, what type of access do you have to guys like Nathaniel? And if you could, you know, could access somebody like Nathaniel, like what, you know, what would you need from him or what would you want from him? Um, basically like, like the Jumpstart program that he comes on for last year, I was there as well. Um, those programs are really good for the kids because at that they get exposed to NBA type players, NBA type coaches, and stuff like that. And I think um, six players get a chance to travel overseas and play in the Caribbean and also get a chance to travel to New York for the final day. So those programs, those programs are really good for the kids because it gives them a lot of exposure to like basketball outside of Jamaica. I just feel like to be coached by different coaches like from overseas and stuff like that. Okay. Nat, I know you've worked with like basketball beyond borders and stuff with, in Africa, right? What are some things that you think that Jamaica could take from learning from that program now, maybe we can bring it over to the Jamaican side and try and incorporate some of the same things. What are some things that they do well? Because there's a, a bunch of guys coming in from Africa now that are coming into the NBA and making big impact. How do you think, is it possible to kind of take that model, move to Jamaica and see if we can? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I mean, I think what they're doing now, like. That that organization with Giants of Africa that I was involved with that that was Masai Ujiri, right? He right. he's picking certain countries uh, per year. He's trying to uh, bring coaches over there, having a top fifty camp in each country and things of this nature to yeah. try and improve the game. Um, and I try to identify talent and try to help them again, helping the coaches 
the, the amount of community coaches that are involved, um, that is the big piece. Um, and, and being here in Canada, to be honest, from where our national team has come from to maybe one to two NBA players right. to now 16, right. it, it's kind of the same process. And what I believe um, what has been done is, is really hit the grassroots level. You know, so identifying 12, 13 year olds, wow, this kid's 6'5, 12 years old. He's six foot. He has big, ar long arms, big feet. Maybe he's going to, like, and then now let's invest into these kids. Um, what do they need? What kind of things do they need from, you know, is it training, um, weight training, individual skills practice? Um, but again, the resources to do that and the infrastructures that we talked about always will come down to coaching. I think, I think now in our country, the coaching has gotten so much better. Um, the amount of trainers that have tried to invest into the youth now has grown. At, at one point, I remember everybody was trying to train with Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> now you have, <laughs> now you have a, um, a plethora of options. And I think the biggest thing and what I loved about going to Digicel and Jumpstart in Jamaica, while I was in Kingston, yeah, we got to work with the kids and we got to get them better. But the best part for me was, you know, lunch break, after camp, sitting with the coaches and them having questions and me answering and putting them through things. This is how you teach it. This is how you break it down. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, here in Toronto, there in Africa, there in Jamaica, the kids are not going to get better until the coaches search out professional development to allow themselves to get better, to allow the kids to get better. Um, and I think that's how you, that's how you grow a country. Yeah, you you know, and that's so huge about what what you're saying because you know a lot of people talk about you know the explosion of Canadian basketball and and um, you know at you got the, the Raptors and you got Vince and everybody's you know sort of convinced that it just you know it took putting an NBA team here to make that happen and that's not taking anything away from it but the reality like you said is we were very fortunate because even the generation before me they were already teaching us you know we were already sort of being groomed for that opportunity when it came and a lot of people don't you know don't really realize that 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 guys like David Joseph had me in the gym when I was in high school. And if you don't know David Joseph, he's Corey Joseph's dad, um, you know, with the Kings. And and he was, had me in the gym doing skill development. And right. he exposed me to that type of training. And guess what I did? I exposed it. And it, along the way, you know, guys were, you know, this was happening. And and there was a, there was a lot of great talent that a lot of people didn't know about. So the thing about, you know, um, what you're saying in terms of, access to the trainers and, and having access to better coaching. It's like, it really was beginning to happen. It was sort of percolating before the explosion. And by the time we got to the explosion, you know, guys like you are, you know, like we're already, you know, in, um, you know, in among a lot of other good talented people and you just needed to be discovered, you know? And I think that's, that's something that was happening in Canada. Yeah, I, I mean, I, no, I, I totally agree. I think the other big piece and, the, and what I'm hearing are the guys that did make it out, that did go to college, that were exposed to coaching, were now coming back. Absolutely. When, when, I was fin when, when I was finished, when you were finished college and you were playing pro, you went back. Uh, Rowan Bear, before he became the general manager, he was in the gym with kids, right? Like, I went to college, I went back, so... As much as we're having, you know, guys go, they're coming back and investing back into the community because they're the ones exposed to the coaching that really needs to help the youth. So the guys in Jamaica that do get these Division One scholarships um, and all these things, it's time to go back and now invest into the youth and, and, and use your knowledge to what you've been exposed to to start helping these kids and the fruits of the labor may not come till later, but you have to start somewhere. You have to start planting the seeds and, and the kids that you see now that are in the NBA are second generation, third generation kids. Right. They're not, we didn't have the, the guy that just came. My mom came, had me, I'm exposed. 
I don't make it, but the percentage of my son, or my son's friend going, just went from 10% to 25%. Right. Exactly. To some type of level. And that's what's happening. Like, Absolutely. Robert Barrett didn't make it, but his son did. You know what I mean? And I see all these kids play. It's, yeah, my dad played here. Yeah. And Jalen Williams' dad played here. And this guy. So I think right now in Jamaica, what you're seeing is, you know, guys are starting to go Division One over and over and over again. And so now when they're starting the second um, generation to third, I think you're going to see more just go a step further. There's more knowledge. Um, and I think that is proven in the track. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the thing, though, with, with Jamaica, Dave, uh, where it's difficult for that to happen in Jamaica because without courts, without infrastructure, you know, it's not like New York or Toronto. Like when guys want to come back, it's like even for, you know, if they didn't, you know, they will, you know, tell them like, you know, it's it's very difficult to, for people to access courts and access places to, you know, to hold camps and different things like that. Uh, maybe you can tell me, tell us a little bit more about that because that's something that you had shared with me as well. Like for other sports, like um, for track and field and football and soccer, you just see um, these kids are playing from age four, um, five, six, because all of the primary school have a, a track or have a, a football field. So they can be exposed to those sports. Like I don't think there is, there's 10 um, primary school with basketball courts over Jamaica. There's maybe two or three primary school with basketball courts. So that is one of the biggest problems. Yeah. So these kids don't get exposed to basketball until high school. And when they do reach high school, there's a limited amount of high school who do have court or who play a basketball league. Wow. So court Great. is one of the biggest problems we have that, overall that, in Jamaica. Like, they don't get exposed to the sports. Like Sometimes it, a, a kid don't know what basketball is till mid high school. Yeah. And that's the biggest problem. You see like a kid that um, sit, 6, 10, 6, 11, um, 16 year old, never touch a basketball in his life because his high school don't take part in the basketball competitions. And that's. Yeah, that's, that's a problem. So then, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, and Akeem, Akeem, like you, you like in, what I, what I remember, cause I, you know, I lived in New York for a bit and, and it was the first time I was exposed to the fact that there are generations of, of great basketball players. Yeah. Know? two, three generations, and, and he's uh, what Nat just described here is more of a recent thing now, where you got, you know, Bobby Llewellyn, and then he was a great player, then his son is a great player, and, you know, Rowan Barrett and his son becomes a great player. But in in, a, in America, in, in New York, that was already going on for two, three, four generations. Um, tell us about that. Yeah, like, like I said, man, growing up in New York was very different, man, because it, it is the sport, right? It is the it is the main sport. So when when you when you wake up when you wake up every day, there's there's always new competition is because this guy's father or this guy's brother or sister played at such a high level that it just trickled down to them. Yeah. And, and that and that's what I'm saying, like as far as like the national team, it is it is very important, especially from the experience that I had that you pick the right 12 to 18, 20 people to, to get this team together. And when you bring them down there, you just can't always talk about just winning. You got to talk about what you have to implement in the country because for that month that you're in that country, you got to have these young players, you got to have these young kids come to these practices and listen and learn after the practices is done. We, we don't have the facilities right now in Jamaica to, to have these different camps. But use what we got. So we're going to bring players in, right, for the next month, month and a half that we're there training. Try to get as many young players in there. Try to get as many co uh, coaches in there. Have open practices. Allow the coaches afterwards to have these meetings. Like Nate said, after the, after the practices, they had dinners and they talked, and he was able to teach that way as well. And I think that that's one of the most important uh, parts in, in building um, this team in Jamaica to rebuilding this team is listen let's let's start having open practices let's start having open discussions allow the public to come in and see these practices and scrimmage so they can learn on the fly as best as possible absolutely right. now i know you talked about i know you coach in the nba and you coach with uh, team canada but would you ever be interested in 
coaching with the national team in Jamaica or like, you know, I think it's important to have guys like yourself, you know, of that Jamaican heritage who made it to that level of coaching, even like university D1 coaches come back and be a part of this coaching staff. Is that, is that something that you ever thought about or ever interested you? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, it's always about giving back. It's always about learning. Um, I actually met um, the president at the time, Paul and Gordon, right? Uh, when when I was in Kingston, and you know, we talked about coaching. Um, how how are you going to affect the cadet level, the junior level, as well as the senior level um, for the country to keep growing? Um, and for me, to make, I mean, I, I know I'm here. I'm doing these things with our country and and with my team. But any way I can always give back and help. For me, it's it's a no brainer. Um, and I guess for me, I would go more to. Uh, helping the coaches grow. If I'm not able to be involved from from a staff point of view or whatnot, well, helping the coaches for me is is, is priority. Um, and so that would be the biggest thing that I would want to do. And that's great. Cause Dave, uh, as far as we had a guest come on from Jamaica, left a, a message saying that, you know, Nat, can you come down and bring some coaching curriculum, <laughs> you know, to help out? I mean, yeah. Dave, is that something that's, that's needed, like coaching actual curriculum is needed for the coaches. Coaching curriculum. Repeat that. I'm not doing. Um, we had a guest come on and, and say that and ask Nat if he could come down and bring some coaching curriculum to help out the coaches. Um, is that something that's really needed? That's something because Nat wants to help the coaches. That is that something that's needed? Some curriculum and things like that to help the coaches. Yes, for sure. Because um. As I said, like with the curriculum, like we don't have, we, do, we, we have lack of primary school coaches in Jamaica, like maybe five or four primary school coaches. So that would be, that would help a lot, because exposing kids to basketball from a early age with those program and with those curriculum that would be great. Yeah. So what what coaching curriculum is being used right now? Like, so like, if if you it's if you're the FIBA, the FIBA coaching curriculum, all the coaches are certified by FIBA. Certified. So. At, at, all, at all levels, at every level? Yeah, at okay. all level. Like oh, you have to be a FIBA, FIBA certified coach, coach in Jamaica. Okay. And and, and what about skill, like skill development and and even even just, you know, uh, coaching clinics? Like if so, if Nat, you know, was coming down here, do you guys have coaching clinics where, you know, you invite guys like that or skill trainers? Like, is there something outside of FIBA that, that you know for coaching like, so like most of the times when we get coaching clinic is like um during star search like a camp that keep um once a year they normally have um coaching clinics going on but that is not exposed to all of the coaches it's like a select few who get to work at the camp get those um coaches clinic it's not like a variety where every coaches get a chance to come in and do those clinics but lot we will lock those clinics because uh, the game is evolving and and stuff like that and it's just learn on the fly you just have to go out and research by yourself to to get this stuff it's not like we have clinics going on where we can be um constant just learning and learning uh, about stuff it's have to be based on yourself like you know you have to go out and do your own research okay yeah well uh, well i i mean i mean i've always been wanting to do this stuff and so um let's connect Let's put together a, a Zoom virtual clinic for some coaches, um, yeah. young coaches, older coaches, and let's do two or three sessions where one is about skill development, one is about tactical offense and defense, um, and, and teaching. Uh, whatever we need to do to uh, help build the country, that's what we need to do and get these coaches better. See, sure. and I, I feel the same way too as far as like the players. Like whoever you got, whoever you guys are viewing up, man, I would love to do some Zoom with some of the players. Like I said, man, just coming from playing on the national team, I know how important, like you said, Dave, when 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 the national team start winning, more people want to put money into it, right? Because people people want to be a part of winning. So, like, if whenever you guys feel like you got you got the team that you want, or you got certain players that you want to uh, put together to start building that national team. I'll definitely get on a couple of Zoom calls as well just to talk about talent versus camaraderie and ego versus love of the country. Because for us, 
we, we, uh, our, our problem was this. All right, so when you're trying to go to the Olympics, there's, there's stages, right? So we started the Caribbean stage. We got out that. We got top three. Then we went to Central, where we had to get played against Puerto Rico, DR, um, and some of the other uh, Spanish countries, uh, Spanish speaking countries. And we got out of that one, became bronze in that one. And then we got the FIBA America, where it's now you, it's Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and all these other different countries um, that, are, that are used to going to the world championship because that was the next level, world championship in the Olympics. So we was too yeah. When we got there, one of our biggest problems was uh, ego versus the love of the country. Because now you see all this different, uh, you see the, the, the Mexican coach, the Mexican national coach, he's the top coach from Spain. Another coach from Brazil is coaching the NBA. Calipari at the time was coaching Dominican Republic. So as a pro player, you see tryout in your mind. If I kill them, I may have an opportunity to, to play for their team in a pro season. You see what I'm saying? And and that was and that was kind of our problem where that's where we have to kind of teach our young players, listen, when you come to the national team, let's remove the ego and let's get it to this is for the love of the country. Because the more we win, the more it helps our country. And I think that was like that that has to be ingrained in ingrained in our children and those who are about to come up to play for the national team immediately so we can have that success. Yeah. Well, Nat, um, I think and, and Akeem, you know, thank you. I think I think extending that that opportunity to do a Zoom and and bring more knowledge, you know, um, even from a dis distance is is what Dave and I talked about as Sometimes yeah. we, we got to make this big effort to get the you know to get the ball rolling, but really it, it, it's not. I mean, even for you know one of the initiatives that Dave and I is, is to raise money. It was how we connected was to just to raise raise money to fix his court and throw a cover on his high school court. You know, like it wasn't you know it may not be a, a game changer in terms of you know like the whole country, but you know we figured it would it'd start a snowball effect. And, and in a sense, it did because that's what led me to Coach Rick Turner. And, and and then when I connected with Coach Rick Turner, he shared with me a vision, you know, for what he'd like to do for Jamaica. And I was like, whoa, you know, I can, you know, I, I can co-sign that. I mean, I'd love to be a part of that. So I think what, you know, you know, what you guys are offering, even on, on that level, like in terms of like just getting a few coaches on the Zoom, some people might think that, okay, well, that's not going to change the country, but it's it's going to create a snowball effect, you know, and that snowball effect is, is I think, is what we're hoping to, you know, we're hoping to be a part of that, you know, the snowball effect right now. Um, so, but not just not to go away from what we're talking about, but, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, just a little bit more about your your NBA experience. You know, what, what was that like, um, you know, going – you know, climbing to that, you know, to that level. Um, I mean, it, it, I mean, it, it was a grind. It still is a grind. Um, my goal is to be a head coach one day in the NBA. And I know that, you know, these are all about the, the process and these are necessary steps that need to be taken to get there. Um, so for me, um, just keeping my head down, doing what's necessary, um, try to develop players, um, try to develop a winning team and a winning culture. Um, obviously, I've been in a couple of organizations with the Raptors, with Celtics, and, and now with the Hornets. Um, and so I've seen it from all different angles, um, which is great because if it's about development, I think I was around it a little bit with the Raptors and to see like Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam to go where they needed to get to in terms of winning a championship. And kind of doing the same thing now in, in Charlotte. You know, Kemba left and went. And then we have all these young guys with a lot of talent that are trying to continue to grow. Um, and so for me, this grind and being involved in the NBA is, is great because for me, it's about how do guys get better? How do guys increase their, their value as a player? Um, and as an organization, how do we continue to win and, and breed winning? Now, just for everybody, can you – not the name drop, but name a few of the guys that you directly had uh, influence on in development. I know all the way back from Fresno State, even before, you know what I mean, when you were there as a grad assistant, you just name some of the guys that you had that direct contact with. 
Uh, I mean, I mean, at Fresno, I mean, Tyler Johnson was there when we were there. Um, you know, he went undrafted and ended up signing a pretty good contract in the NBA. Yeah. Um, I, actually, when I was a grad assistant at Fresno State, my my roommate was Paul Watson, who's now a two way two way player with the Raptors. Um, yeah. And so that was it was great for him to like finally crack that and get in there. And then along the way, we've had a lot of young players in Toronto come up. Um, you know, most, <laughs> yeah. most, you're, you're, trying, you're trying to be humble. Yeah. I, mean, I appreciate it, but uh, I mean, no, I mean, most recently, the, the young guys that have you know cracked the NBA: uh, R.J. Barrett, uh, Shea Gilgis Alexander. Um, you know. Those guys have been really good, and, and and guys that I've met in the NBA have tried to help. You know, I work in Charlotte and try to help all the guys, but directly it would be like Devonte Graham, you know, who was up for a most improved player this year, didn't get it. I still don't understand that. But um, um, and then being in Toronto, being around all those guys, you know, Fred, Norm, Norman Powell, um, who's also of Jamaican descent. Uh, you know, Bruno Caboclo, like, to me, I was a, a small portion in all their development. I mean, I think their parents and, and their coaches did a great job in their development. Um, and all I did was is try to help, try to enhance, probably drop a one-two knowledge that those guys didn't know before. And it was great for me. Um, and to be honest, all of them helped me get to where I am. So uh, I'm forever in debt to those players. What are... What a- some of the things that took these guys from being, you know, on the cusp, average. A lot of the guys you, you talked about, they're like, they weren't really huge names. You know what I mean? They came up, they had to grind. What was the kind of switch or what changed in them that got them to that, that propelled them to that next level? If you can name. Like, well, to be you. honest, um, I, I, always, I always can tell the guys who are going to be pretty successful. And it comes down to obsession. That is the one common theme to a lot of players that I see who become really good. They're they're a little bit obsessive with what they want. You show them something, they're obsessive. Uh, I was working with a young kid the other day, and I and I told him about being obsessive and changing his whole mindset of how to become a better basketball player. This is what you're gonna have to do to become a better shooter. Mm-hmm. Um, shoot, shooting is probably the most important skill. And when we're talking about going back to the youth, yeah. our youth in Jamaica need to learn how to shoot. Obviously, you need infrastructure, baskets, and things. But that means our coaches need to learn how to teach shooting. And so I was teaching this kid how to shoot. And the next day, he's recording himself, sending it to me on video. Hey, which parts do you see? What's wrong? This, then, the third. And then sending it back. And then I'm, you know, I'm, vo- I'm voiceovering the video and sending it back. And then the next day he comes back in the gym and he's better. And then the following day he's going at it again. And I'm, and I'm just like, to me, he's obsessed. Right. He's obsessed with the process because, yeah, you teach me something, but I'm not waiting till I get back to see you again. Right. I'm going home. I'm learning how to do it. I'm videoing it. I'm watching. That's the beauty of this phone. So now you're able to help kids and you're not even with them particularly. You know what I mean? Um, and so that that's the part that I saw a lot of guys and even to some point of it, players who are really, really good that almost make it and don't have an obsession about it, that's probably the reason why. Right. Yeah. You know, I agree with that 100%. I mean, I, I mean, I had a chance to, you know, I'm, I'm from the Steve Nash era, so – Getting a chance to be around Steve Nash as a kid, I tell people that you, you got to have a little bit of that. You got to have some OCD. Like you got to be some sort of, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, like Steve was the first person that, you know, I heard talking about makes. Like he wouldn't leave until he made a certain number of shots. And then then he was a obsessive, like, you know, consecutive shots and consecutive makes and consecutive squishes before he leaves the gym. It's like, there was this OCD-ness about him that you're like, man, what's wrong with this guy? Yeah. But you can tell, like, you know, and any time I've been around anybody that had that little something special, I mean, I agree with you. There was just 
they were just something about them that was a little bit OCD that, that they just couldn't leave the gym until they got it right, you know? Let me, and, ask, let me yeah, ask you a question. If can, can, can obsession be taught? Just maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm asking, like, is, well, is that, is that something that can be, like... Well, I think, I mean, I work with young people on a lot of different levels, and... Some things are instilled. But, you know, they say the character is formed between the ages of, you know, three and like seven, depending on, you know, what they say. And okay. it is, it's, a, it's a character trait. And yeah. you can actually instill it, but it's something that has to be, really does have to be instilled early. And I'm not saying it can't be developed later, but the difference is the ones that, that have it naturally, it was, in, it was instilled early. And this is nothing just to do with basketball. It's just, yeah. it's just character development in, in your child. And, and so for a lot of people out there with young kids, you know, you got to really think about that. You know, if, you, if your child is going to be confident, is going to be, you know, driven, or a lot of these traits that, that, you know, we see later on in successful people, it's literally no formative years where that's being instilled, you know. And that's really important.